Sat with me today is Jimmy Harrington. Jimmy's a former professional boxer and now a trainer or co-trainer to champion boxers himself. Good afternoon, Jimmy. Good afternoon, Phil. Now, Jimmy, the reason that we've asked you to come down today and have a chat with us is obviously involved in boxing and you had mental health issues yourself. What exactly happened to you, Jimmy? Um, it was a, a time in my life when I was 29 years old. I had a breakdown. Uh, subsequently from that breakdown, I went and got sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Uh, it wasn't a very happy time in my life and it's just something that I really, really want to bring home to people that are suffering with mental health illness. It's not something uh, that picks and chooses people who goes and, at not, not say attacks, but who, who it gets hold of. Um, you've, it can happen to the very best of us, and which I thought I was. I thought I was the very best, but unfortunately, I uh, woke up one morning and decided to make an attempt on my life. And how did that come about? What what triggered that? Was there like one trigger you think that triggered it off? Not really, no, Phil. Because as I've spoke to you off camera, that everything in my life at that time was going great. I mean, Full time employment. I had a a uh, nice house, um, loving partner, uh, just had my second professional bout and just no, just didn't want to be alive. So you were that low and, and what low, happened, yeah. what did you do? I went to my local GP in May of 2006 and spoke, I did go and try and get help, uh, put me on some start of some medications, it didn't help. Um, but I also think it didn't help because I was still inward. I didn't want to open out to f people around me that loved and cared for me. So you mentioned there, Jimmy, that you, you felt embarrassed, you felt ashamed to come forward and speak. Do you think that was just a, a general thing as, as being a, a man, as being in the yeah. boxing world? No, I, I just think it's the generalisation of mental health. People take class it as a taboo subject and take that backward step from you. Uh, also, I think it's just the, the British, the general Britishness of us, we stiff up a lip, we're I'm better than that, I'm, I'll, I'll get through it, I'm a uh. And no, why? Go and get help, there's people out there, there's networks for you to go to. And you, like you say, you visited your GP, but then yeah. nothing really came of that, and you no, went to the extreme of, of actually trying to take your own life. Yeah, take my own life. I, um, the, the morning in question, and it happened, it was a November morning, eight years ago, so it's coming up to the anniversary uh, in a couple of months. I just jumped in my work van at 7.30, parked up uh, on the M180 motorway bridge. <laughs> I locked you up so no one pinched me van. <laughs> so. uh, and then jumped off the bridge and fortunately, somebody up there didn't want me as of yet. So I thank every day that I'm still here but it's from then on it you, you're in you're in a bubble and it was hard to still get help yeah and, and you're incredibly lucky I mean you look yeah. at all right you, you've been through hell yeah, clearly brought me, brought me back uh, both my legs um, obviously my boxing career ended that that day so I'm never passing medical again um, but yeah very lucky I'm still here yeah, you, you look at I me, mean, boxing sadly is littered with people that aren't. Um, yeah. The likes of Darren Sutherland, the Olympian, yeah. um, came across to, to England from Ireland. Sadly, sunk into depression, took his own life. Yeah, um, Dean, Dean Powell, Powell yeah. the matchmaker, a man who was profoundly helpful to me personally, obviously as a boxing MC. When I first started out, Dean was one of those people who would help anyone. He was just yeah. a nice, nice, lovely guy. And he didn't help me with, with work, but he helped me with advice and, he, and support, and he was always there. Um, <coughs> for those people that don't know Dean Powell, he was, he was Frank Warren's matchmaker, um, and he sadly threw himself in front of a train yeah, last yeah. year. I, I spoke to him two days before, and I had no idea. I had no idea whatsoever. That, that's just it, Phil. Um, nobody does have any idea unless you do come out and speak about it. They're not, it's, as we spoke about, it's, it's a taboo subject. It divides people. Yeah. Now... You either come out and say, yay, I'm that person who's suffering a little bit, or you continue and suffer 
It's as simple as that. And it gets to the point where the only way out that you can see is to end your life because that's how dark and desperate you become. Why do you think boxing is so rife with mental health problems? I think it's it's a sport that's um, you, you, it's a very bullish sport, isn't it? Very uh, tough. It's a tough man sport. So um, to answer that question properly, Phil, I really don't know why it is boxing. I think is it the training you're on your own a lot of the time? It's a desolate and it's an inward. You've got teams around you, but as and when you do get in the boxing ring, it's yourself in there, yeah. and you're very raw. If you know, you're exposed. Everything's exposed about you in there. Is it the macho thing as well? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, it can be. You can. You think, well, I'm tough. I can get through this, but then you get that elation of being right up there at the pinnacle, as it's happened with the elite boxers. Um, Joe Calzaghe, uh, Ricky Hatton, to name Frank Bruno, Bruno, of course. Frank Bruno, a very uh, famous one of it. Um, and it just gets you to that point. So where do I go from here? So where you went was a motorway bridge. Yeah, um, I did, yeah. Incredibly, course. well, incredibly you survived, which is yeah. amazing. But what happened then? Yeah, from that, that point there, I was admitted with physical and mental injuries. Um, my physical injuries were taken care of at Sheffield Northern General. My mental injuries were taken care at uh, Great Oaks in Ashby of Scunthorpe. Um, and the mental side of the injuries were never really taken care of. They were just masked over uh, and then went back home. Um, and I still felt the same as I did when I went in there. Uh, I came out of there in around February of 2007 and then my second admission to hospital was May 2007 where I ended up in Doncaster, DRI and was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Right, so you'd been in once having, having jumped off yeah. the bridge, um, you came out of there, you then got sectioned um, yeah. and you were sent to Doncaster. Yeah. And is that where you feel that things started to turn around for the better? Yeah, things started to turn around for the better then. I'd, I'd reached my lowest point then, then Phil. Um, I'd never made another attempt on my life, but I was still very, very down, very depressed, very inward, not really s s got the help and seek the help that I needed. Uh, and from going into Doncaster and section, that's when I feel things start to change around and it's, it's funnily or unfunny however way you want to look it took one year from from the November of 2006 to November 2007 that is when I would say my life is I was back to normal whatever normal is right. it was just a, a one year um, never had a, an episode of depression since those times but I believe that's because I've got a fantastic network around me. Right, I was going to ask that actually, yeah. your, your family, your friends, how did they react? Did they know and, and what did they do? Yeah, my, my family, speaking about the original incident in 2006 when I made the attempt on my life, um, now this is just the way my, my, my dad handled it, he, he said, oh, we spoke to my mum and my brothers and things, he said, uh, oh, we'll just tell people it's had a car accident. Now, is that just trying to, like, buy time or save me face? You don't know. I respect that's how, what he chose to do, Phil, and I won't blame him, but it's, yet yeah, again, why don't we all just speak about it? I made an attempt in my life. It's me that had to carry that. Yeah, and thankfully, I think the support you received, the help you received... Yeah. Let's go through to where you are today. You're still involved in boxing, yeah. very heavily, um, yeah. as a trainer alongside Dave Hulley yeah. um, over in Doncaster. And I mean, you train, you know, you're involved with the training of, of Jamie and Gary McDonald, yeah. world and, and British champion, yeah, uh, Maxi yeah. Hughes, and, and several other boxers. I know you're heavily involved with the amateur scene as well. Yeah. Um, how does boxing sort of work for you now in your life? Well, what happened? 
to get to that point, Phil, in 2010, I came back into boxing, uh, went back to my gymnasium where I trained of, and there was an amateur club running there at the time. I just went and just did a little bit of training just to get a little bit of physical shape back. So I put a lot of weight on and got to 22 stone. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it was just getting back out there and seeing people and meeting people. And the chap at the time who whose gymnasium we always use, Pete Bell, who's involved with Doncaster, the Dons. Yeah, with the rugby league. Yeah. He, uh, he invited me down to, to just... Just, be, just being in and around the gymnasium, just get me back out there. Um, from there, we got the charity back up and running, the Spirit of Freedom Project. Um, we reset up the amateur club. So it's, it's just taken over everything, really. It's given me some focus, some purpose in life. Yeah, which is fantastic. Now, yeah. you mentioned rugby league there, because I know the Doncaster Rugby League used to use the gym. You still do, Phil. Still do. Right, yeah. and, and you've been involved with those guys. Now, in rugby league, there is a charity called State of Mind, and we had uh, Paul Schoolthorpe was on Radio Yorkshire last week talking about State of Mind, and that's a charity that addresses mental health issues within the sport of rugby league, which, again, has had real issues. Uh, Terry Newton, it's a year ago this week, sorry, I think it's four years this week since... Terry Newton sadly passed away, the great Britain Wigan and Wakefield hooker. Um, Paul's own brother Danny had real mental health issues as well, and unfortunately, it's another sport that's littered with it. Rugby League has now got the State of Mind charity, which visits the amateur clubs. It visits every club from Super League right the way down to the juniors. Do you think it's time for boxing to get a State of Mind style organisation? Yeah, it wouldn't necessarily have helped McCall and Moran, Dean Powell. Uh, the late Billy Smith and others, but we just don't know. Well, let's give it a go. Yeah, let's try. Let's see what is out there. Any youngsters in boxing or, or in any form of life today, what advice would you give them? What What would you say to them if you had that chance? My best piece of advice I could give anyone is ask for help. Don't shy away from it. Don't cower away from it. Don't hide stand up, as that old expression is, be a man, yeah, and I say that in the sense of, just go and seek help, but on the same token of that, make sure it's the right help for you. So it's a bigger thing to ask for yeah. help than to try and handle it on your own? Yeah, definitely. That's brilliant. Jimmy, yeah. thank you very much for your time today, I, I appreciate you coming down here, and I appreciate it's not an easy subject to talk about, we've known each other for, for many years, and I, I didn't know this side of you. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you.